Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don sitting in the host chair today, along with our regular contributor and newly dubbed Fork Finder. My, Chris and I were talking off podcast. I think that's also going to be added to his ever-growing list of titles. So Chris Capola, good to have you here for the first recording that you and I are doing here in 2021. Thanks, Thanks for having me, Don. And uh you know, I'd also like to look into Holy Roman Emperor. I don't think anybody's been using that title for a while. So it's been it's it, it, it it's been vacant for a while, and yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, it was was I think we we were talking about this at one point before. It's a different thing. You know, my favorite thing about that it when it comes to that, it's neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. So um, why yeah. not? Let's claim it. <laughs> Let's claim it. Uh, actually, you can't claim it, Chris. Do you know why? I think you actually have to be of Habsburg descent to actually uh, to grab that one you got to have the Habsburg chin working for you so um, it was technically elected no, that's true time. that's true it it, yeah. it just held a common uh uh it just it just held a common it always was Habsburgs but you exactly. know I feel like we should start a kickstarter just to get some campaign funds together to get re-elected Holy Roman Emperor uh, I'm for it. I'm for it. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll 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 throw something in the. Sh- if you look down in the show notes and see a link to the Kickstarter, you know that we did that by the time we actually posted the show. So as you can tell, by the way, we started this off. The part of the reason we enjoy having Chris as part of the podcast is is he brings he brings humor and he brings insight, and I value both of those things. So today, uh, Chris, we're going down uh, trying to do this a little bit more frequently, and we've built a pretty good library of these things now uh, to sort of work through. We're going down another uh, listener suggestion here. And so this one actually comes from Joe McCullough. So shout out to Joe. Um, And yours actually jumped ahead of some of the others because not that yours is easier to do, but it was sort of a little bit more contained than some of the other topics. So we thought we would start with it. Uh, But Joe suggested that we talk about a scenario where the United States fleet was defeated at the Battle of Manila Bay in 1898. So Joe, you asked for it and... uh, we're the Burger King of podcasts here. You can have it your way. So we're going to talk about that now. So Chris, immediately I had to stop and think for a second, even though I'm pretty well versed. I had to remember, okay, which, okay, that's the Spanish-American War. Yes. So yes. just for our listeners' benefit, we were talking about this a little bit off podcast. Um, in some ways, that's sort of a forgotten war, right? Do you think from an American perspective, we sort of overlook that one? We definitely do. We definitely do. It's not taught as much it's not um as well known and you know if anybody generally the thing an american knows about the spanish american war is a picture of teddy roosevelt riding a horse up a hill and we're just gonna we're not gonna get into everything wrong with that picture but that's (laughs) kind of the popular image of what happened in that war right and as as again (laughs) Also, at least it's an aptly named war. We're pretty clear on who the who the combatants are. It's Spain and America, hence the Spanish American War. Um, and it is a it is a conflict that has global scale, although it's very regionalized and localized where it is fought. So, uh, Spain is in the waning days of its imperial glory. It still has possessions. For example, some of those possessions are in the Philippines, but the thing that really, you know, without going a lot into the whole cause of the war, as we talk about the historical what did here, most of what the motivation for this war was about for the United States was obviously all about Cuba. And so there had been the the mysterious explosion of the USS Maine early in 1898, some question about whether the Spanish were responsible for that. And so suddenly, a few months later, there's a formal declaration. I actually was looking at this in some of the study notes as I was preparing. One of only five times Congress has actually declared war in the United States. Been more conflicts than that, but this was one of the actually declared wars. And so there's the declaration of war between the United States and Spain, and suddenly we're off to hostilities. So, uh, 
The Philippines is one of the locations in question. Cuba is one of the other locations that there, but you mentioned somebody already that we would have a picture of, and that's that's Mr. Roosevelt, Teddy. Um, he's not a naval guy, right? Or is he a naval guy? What's the story behind TR? Um, well, he's undersecretary of the Navy at this point, but it's kind of one of those, they kept trying to find an office to hide him in, and they never succeeded. That was one of the places they tried to hide him, is undersecretary of the Navy. What, what damage can he do there, right? Yeah, what damage can he do there? Well, um, apparently the damage that he can do there is uh, perhaps issue some orders with maybe Superior not knowing about it? <laughs> so, basically the story is the Secretary of the Navy is out of the office and didn't, I, you know, I, I the best way I can think of it is he forgot to close his outlook. Ah. Um, and Roosevelt goes over and in this is during that time frame when we are quote unquote investigating the main when we think it might be Spain or might be this or that and Roosevelt basically goes ahead and orders the Ameri the United States Asiatic Squadron which had been uh, in Hong Kong to prepare and sail to the Philippines to engage Spanish forces there under the assumption that Congress is going to declare war. The, the best thing I can think of is kind of a movie which, you know, more people need to see, Dr. Strangelove, where this crazy, you know, 1960s Air Force general launches a bunch of bombers at the Soviet Union and says, well, you guys better start it now. Just on his own authority, he lost it and just went ahead and did something like that. Right. Basically started a war with, like, you know, you mentioned, yes, Congress did declare war at this time. Congress has the right to declare war. There's a chain of command things, and I don't need to pull it out, but um, Undersecretary of the Navy is not on that. <laughs> right. <laughs> or, or at least in terms of the, the even even the uh, the chain of command, it's a ways down the chain of command, to say the least. Right, right. It, it, it normally is transmitting that person in that office would be transmitting orders, not giving them is a fair way to describe it. Yeah. So just again, I want to cover if I can just really quick the what did here, just and I'll probably again include some links as I often do in the show notes, just uh, nothing else. Wikipedia pages and other, you know, uh, encyclopedic type entries for those that want to read a little bit more. War was formally declared on April 21 of 1898 this battle took place on may 1st so it does give you an idea about the fact that things were already in motion given that we're talking about a battle that's a, that's occurring halfway around the world in asia and in this case it's the it's the u.s pacific i guess it's fair enough to call them pacific i guess they call them pacific squadron they really didn't call them the pacific fleet is the best of my is the best of my memory there Actually, the American Asiatic Squadron here, as I look right. at my notes, even, even a better name, uh, which is under the command of Commodore George Dewey, and they encounter the Spanish Pacific Squadron under uh, a rear, rear admiral there for the Spanish, whose last name is uh, Montojo. And as we were talking about, because this does lead into the fork here, this also has a little bit of an element of a reverse Pearl Harbor, but with the declaration already having been made, is that the Spanish were really surprised to have this attack upon them so quickly after the declaration of hostilities. Partly because Roosevelt had already put things in motion again very quickly. So the battle is fairly one-sided. Uh, the United States has suffers very few casualties. Neither side suffer super large number of casualties. There's not a lot of ships there. I think the official number for the United States is like 13, two or 300 for the Spanish, but it's a resounding defeat for the Spanish with the typical story around this being that uh, the U.S. had superior ships, had the advantage of surprise and a number of things that worked in their favor. So it's very unlikely uh, that there would have been a Spanish victory, but wait a second, we're the alternate history podcast. We need to change the outcome here. So Chris, how are we going to, with some sense of reasonableness, flip this to a Spanish win? Shore batteries. 
Ah, it's not just always about guns on ships. It can be about guns on land. Yeah, they could turn that way. Um, <laughs> unless you're the British in Singapore. But that, that that's something different. We'll, we'll come across that at some point. Um, basically, the Spanish fleet came out to meet the Americans and didn't pay attention to the fact that, hey, we've got all this support we could be using and we're not going to. So they come out into the, you know, not middle, but out past the cover that the shore batteries can provide and get not wiped out, but beaten badly. If they stayed closer in or maybe drew the United States Asiatic Squadron in, then they stood a better chance because then they're bringing literally all their guns to bear. Right. And under that scenario, again, these are, it's not like there's a huge um, American fleet. This pretty much is, you know, the bulk of the warships that are in the Pacific theater, again, the, the Asiatic operation. So get them close enough into shore, get the shore batteries taking advantage of that. You change the outcome here. This is not just a minor skirmish is what I, the point I guess I'm trying to make. This would be pretty substantial for the naval outlook for the war in the Pacific. One way I or the other. Fair. I think yeah. that's pretty fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. So again, that's how we're going to fork this when we come back from the break here in a minute in terms of the alternate thing. And then we'll pick up talking a little bit about what was the real impact of this in the real timeline historically. Uh, but then certainly now that we know how we can change the outcome, we'll talk about what that different outcome means. So hope to see you back in a couple of minutes. Would groceries delivered to you in as fast as one hour save you a trip to the store? Instacart makes that possible thanks to personal shoppers in your area who hand-select items based on your preferences from the stores you love. And shopping multiple stores is possible on a single order. Instacart picks the freshest produce and even keeps your eggs safe, all while finding everything you usually buy, providing smart suggestions for new items, and even highlighting deals to help you save money. And now you get free delivery on your first order over $35. Let Instacart know we sent you and help support our show by following the link in the show notes. Instacart. Groceries delivered in as fast as one hour. And coming back in three, two, one. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don joined by our regular contributor, Chris, today. And we have uh, taken the magical what-if machine back to May of 1898. And as we talked about in the open, we've changed the outcome of the Battle of Manila Bay. And now Spanish forces have been victorious. And the, uh, the American forces that have been victorious there in the Philippines have lost. So in the real timeline, Chris, we talked about the big picture for the... Uh, U.S. victory during the Spanish-American War, the, the common historical understanding there is this is what thrust the United States onto the world stage, the true global superpower, right? The war of the and, whole, yes, go ahead. and more specifically in East Asia, this really starts us getting involved there into China and, you know, whatever that leads to. Right. And so this is, um, again, this is not just dealing with, with, with Spanish, you know, Spanish control of Cuba and the, you know, 90 miles away in the American backyard, but this is far flung across the globe. We have projected, we being the United States, have projected naval power globally. And I'm thinking about, is it Alfred Mahan that wrote the book that sort of talked about, um, uh, you know, the importance of projecting naval power. So the United States has done that. So the United States has stepped up and they defeated a, a classic European power, even though it's a power, a colonial power in decline in the case of Spain. So the United States is now a recognized figure on the world stage and uh, continues to expand her forces uh, globally to support the fact that now they have uh, the occupation of the Philippines, although that turns into a whole different thing that we could go down that's a that's a tangential path there. But another outcome of this is shortly after this, the United States actually uh, takes another action, which is important in the long term in, in terms of the annexation of Hawaii. So made perfect sense to go ahead and annex Hawaii when you had interest further flung in the Pacific that you needed to take care of and you needed a, a base of operations in, in the middle. So U.S. victory at Battle of Manila Bay, 
establishes the U.S. as a, as a global power with participation in Asia, leads to the annexation of Hawaii, leads to things that go on in the Philippines, not just now, but down the road. So it sets up history, what, for the next, we were talking about this off podcast, 40 or 50 years for what's going on with the United States in uh, the Asian theater of operations, even before the Russo-Japanese War and before World War I. So the other thing that happens is in the real timeline, Mr. Teddy Roosevelt doesn't get in trouble for this action, right? <laughs> um, not to confuse people, but I, I quoted uh, another, you know, Philippines, Cuba. Uh, I quoted a Kennedy speech uh, after the Bay of Pigs. Victory has a thousand fathers, but uh, defeat is an orphan. So, right. yeah, he... Um, he is not looked upon as kindly as as scampish. I guess that's kind of how like Washington establishment looks at Teddy Roosevelt as a scamp, as this rapscallion. I'm I'm trying to think of Victorian terms to <laughs> apply to him, but you know, okay, you know, well, just promise you're not going to start any more wars on your own, and uh, we'll just forget about this one. Right, and of course that leads to him being a, a crucial force in the founding of the Rough Riders, which is the image you were talking about, you know, this uh, this interesting ragtag group of volunteers who go down and, and are part of the, uh, the operations in Cuba, the United States eventually being successful there, although with that being a more challenging military thing. So the end result of the war is the uh, with the treaty that's done there, the United States ends up paying some money uh, to offset the fact that there are Spanish, I guess, infrastructure improvements that have been made in the Philippines that essentially are being paid for, but the United States gains control of the Philippines, which they choose not to annex, but that was one of the things that had been thought about. Uh, there was already something in place that said the United States would not annex Cuba, that they were fighting this for Cuba's independence, but then later you have the amendment that goes into place, which creates the interest in the United States about what's happening with Cuba. The United States does pick up Guam, <laughs> and that's a solid, you know, now it's possession or territory. And so the United States comes out of the backside of the war, global power with possessions now globally. And, uh, you know, again, uh, especially as Roosevelt will become president in just three short years with the assassination of McKinley, uh, walking tall and carrying a big stick. Absolutely. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's. Yeah, that's what happened. I mean, oh. that's what happened in our timeline. Yeah. So now we're going to the forked timeline. What's different? So now there's defeat. So let's let's start with the the thing that's not the Roosevelt thing. Even though I just set up, let's talk about the other thing we didn't talk about, which actually did happen in the Philippines. Is the United States wasn't the only navy that was. Uh, kicking around over there with the Spanish Navy. Who else was there, Chris? Uh, the German Hochflicht, uh, huh. German High Seas Fleet, uh, started sniffing around. If if you look at, you know, hmm, going back to Wilhelm II, I want a scorecard. I want to know how many times I met, bring him back up. <laughs> um, started a policy of Weltpolitik. And which is kind of a nice way of saying whenever there's trouble anywhere, I'm going to stick my nose in and see if I can pick up a colony. Yeah. And this seemed like a good shot at that. Yes. Yes, it was. The German high C the German um, Pacific squadron actually did sail into Manila Bay and supplied the Spanish forces in Manila because basically the United States, yeah, we beat the Spanish Navy. We didn't have an army to invade very right. much. So the Germans were supplying the Spanish ashore because they were busy fighting the Filipino insurgents. Um, so if the United States can't, doesn't take over the Philippines, it's likely, you know, especially given, let's think about this for a second. One of the reasons that Spain is declining is because they are, a power kind of waning and after they've lost cuba their major like cash colony you got kind of a same situation the french were in when they sold louisiana which is well we've lost the empire 
let's cash out. Let's get, you know, sell it to Germany, get some cash to sustain the economy for a little bit longer. Right. And so, again, under that scenario, two things happen. Again, the obvious, there's no um, U.S. interest in the area, not the same way. But the other thing, there is an expanded German occu occupation. And Germany had other interests in Asia. So they, they're just a bigger player now in Asia under this right. scenario. Right. And, and like you said, it may have been, you know, how it may have gone down, may have been taking it or it might have been, you know, buying it, whatever the case might be. But the clear result there is there's no U.S. presence, you know, in that part of the Pacific, at least as a result of this event. There may have been because of something else. And um, and there is more of a German presence there. I don't want to chase that path too far, except to just mention that's an interesting little side note to think about. But to me, I'm more I'm more in, in terms of the big, more impactful fork here. I'm going to focus on our good man, Mr. T.R., because, again, as we talked about, if he comes out of this. Uh, not being the uh, the secret author of a victory, but the secret author of American humiliation and other things like that. I'm guessing things are not going to go the same for Mr. Roosevelt. Uh, I agree. Uh, you know, the the question is whether he can join the Rough Riders and get out of Cuba before the warrant hits him. Yeah, that, that's kind of what it, the situation it, it, is. It's so, so at a minimum, let's talk about that. He's the undersecretary of the Navy. Um they're going to be looking for a scapegoat. They're going to be looking for a fall guy, right? He's, a fall he, guy, yes, but you know, he he definitely made like, he didn't make it very hard for him to blame him. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. So, what do you think is the is the um, what do you think is the realistic? I mean, so May one's the battle, so you know takes maybe a day or two for news to get back so by may 3 in washington what happens um you know the same thing that happens in many all the other declared wars when defeats start happening congress calls investigations i'm thinking about the uh congressional committee on the conduct of the war during the american civil war and and as as much havoc as that could have played but uh there's investigations into it, and I feel like, you know, we discussed this a little bit. Um, maybe another thing that might be mentioned again soon. In a couple of years, Churchill is going to be the very interesting similar position because he's the first uh, Lord of the Admiralty, gets blamed for Gallipoli, resigns, and goes to the trenches on the Western Front, almost as an atonement that, okay, I'm going to register as a regular soldier and go do my part. And there's a possibility, I think, that Roosevelt is at least able to do that. But the thing is, as soon as the war's over, he's under investigation again, and it really, it, it I think his actions would have been a political death knell. He, you know, even if he would have done his part with the Rough Riders, I feel like, you know, starting wars as an undersecretary, like that is probably so far that the American people, especially after congressional hearings publicizing it, think he's a little unhinged. Yeah. And so it's, you know, we're whether he's able to, he's still a fairly young man at that point. Uh, I often forget how young he was when he when he um, when he moved into the presidency because you know, he always feels older to me. Mm -hmm. Probably it's the black and white thing. I want to <laughs> say he was forty two. Yeah, he's he's in his early forties. So, right. but it's very difficult to imagine this happening in um, eighteen ninety eight, and what happened in the real timeline, <laughs> which is. Um, that he's, you know, in, in the real time line, three years later, he's the vice president. Right. Right. Uh, it's it's difficult for me to imagine that even if he does resurrect or redeem or pick an R word here that's positive for him, uh, it's hard for me to imagine that that happens in three years. So he's definitely not going to be the vice presidential. He's not going to be the vice president for McKinley in 1901. 
Right. And, and if he's not the vice president for McKinley in 1901, he's not ready to assume the presidency when McKinley is assassinated in late 1901. And so you literally, as you, you know, about this, you know, one, you know, a shore battery in the Philippines changes the world kind of thing. But uh, that shot, that shot may not have been heard around the world, but it would have been felt as a big ripple through American politics of the early 20th century. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. who is, you know, is, is there a Republican? We, we didn't talk about this off podcast. I, I like to be on script. Is there a Republican that probably is in that stead instead of Roosevelt? I know Fairbanks, I think, was um, Roosevelt's vice president. Who would have been McKinley's running mate? in 1900 if it's not for roosevelt i feel like he may well have just carried over his previous right run a uh, vice president who's you know a non-entity and by the way let me throw something else out there um the next president after roosevelt uh william howard taft is from a from a see, see previous episode i'll definitely put the link in this uh yeah you know, where, you know, obviously the situation between Roosevelt and Taft, that was a, an episode that you and I did. Right. No, no Teddy Roosevelt, no William Howard Taft. Well, more than or, or, in a, or in a different role, perhaps not, not, not with, you know, with Roosevelt's uh, support and then what turns negative between the two of them that we talked about before. Well, not just that. Um, Taft was appointed as the civilian governor of the Philippines. That is what made him a national figure. That is what got him noticed by national people. So, yeah, we never even get to that point. <laughs> right. And then, again, just to continue how the ripples often work when you're going down the alternate timeline, as we talked about before, the reason the, the election in 1912 turns out the way that it does, again, see our previous episode here, No Bull Moose Party, I think, is, if I remember correctly, was the title of that episode. Mm -hmm. You know, the odds of you getting a Wilson without the Roosevelt Taft, um, you know, the, the, the third party element of the 1912 election is also altered. And as, as we talked about on that episode, so we don't need to go fully down that path. But if you don't have Wilson in office, you know, during from 1912 to 1920, that's also a very different different element of, as we move into the World War One period with the United States. Something jump, just jumped across my mind. But let let you're you're correct. You're correct. Um, I'll I've got a pin in it. I will come back to it. All I right, promise. fair enough. <laughs> um, so let's say that Roosevelt does rehabilitate. We talked about there. You know, the immediate thing is he probably would not be able to rehabilitate in a period of time that would, um, you know, that would obviously let him become vice president and then ascend to the presidency with the unfortunate assassination. Mm -hmm. So let's say that he does go off. He, he, he does, you know, the rehabilitation does sort of happen with his participation with the Rough Riders. Uh, so he comes back. Uh, he's connected enough that he's going to be able to probably find his way forward in politics to some degree. So, you know, under that scenario, this may have been your pen that we come back to, or if not, uh, what do you think is the most likely outcome for a rehabilitated Roosevelt? There, I found one more R word to go with it. Um, I actually am now thinking about um, the other connection I made, which was not the pen I just talked about, uh, to, again, the other naval personnel who had a failure, resigned government just to go into. Yeah, he came back. Um, I challenge anyone to remember who the first Lord of the Admiralty after Churchill was. We know that name because of what he did after the First World War. And I think a Roosevelt being as pro-jingoist as he was, as out there beating the drum as he was, I think it's very interesting to think maybe Roosevelt would have taken office in 1916. Mm. He would have been the logical, been the logical Republican run, um, just later in time. I think he would have been out there pushing for the United States to get involved um, in the First World War. Now, nothing we talked about would have changed that. That's still going to happen. 
So we're still dealing with that situation. And yeah, I think kind of a mad bomber thing almost that the American people might have liked a little a little vigor, a little crazy to lead right. us into that war. Well, and, and I was just looking here because I'm I trying to remember the exact path. And so I had to look at notes. I'd forgotten that, you know, the path between um, 98 and, you know, his, his moving into the vice presidency. In between there, he was elected governor of New York yep. because he was a war hero. And it was only when uh, the vice president died in 1899 that, um, you know, Roosevelt sort of gets elevated Okay. to the you know to being the running mate for the 1900 election so I, i'd forgotten the little set of it was so short there the you know the stint as governor of new york was so short i'd sort of forgotten about what was the intervening thing uh but you know certainly he's out there to be to be a candidate at various points and for various reasons mm -hmm. and um i just i you know, that, that's an interesting thing you know would would the question is would we know would we know TR is just a footnote in history or is he, this goes back to the thing we've talked about so many times before, you know, where it's history looked at the lens of, you know, a force as a personality. TR is going to be somewhere. Well, you know, <laughs> it's I, I, just the question is, where is he going to be in an alternate timeline? I, I, I get back to kind of that earlier comparison of, of those two, of a, of a TR and a, a, a Churchill, that under normal, you know, um, I'm thinking of another man of, of another wonderful movie, The Godfather. They're wartime conciliaries. Mm -hmm. You want them if you are going to fight. And in both Churchill and uh, and TR's uh, this alternate TR of winning in 1916, external circumstances provided the environment for them to shine. I guess is the best way of putting it right. that yes, they were exceptional personalities, but you know, a Teddy Roosevelt in I'm going to say like 1820 era of good feelings would, would not have been noted because there weren't those. It wasn't the circumstances didn't shine on their exceptional abilities i guess is the best way to put it right well and then the other thing that goes with that too again i'm thinking about the hallmarks of the roosevelt administration uh which doesn't happen in the early you know so you know trust busting um the progressive policies that are there certainly there were other advocates for those types of things that was not uniquely roosevelt but it was heavily driven by right roosevelt right Right. And so it's it's not that you could not have imagined another another Republican occupant in the early 20th century in the White House who might not have pursued some of that agenda, the antitrust, you know, the progressive type agenda, but maybe not with the same zeal and maybe not with the same popularity. And, well, you know, I guess Roosevelt sort of known being famous for the bully pulpit, um, you know, not without having that there, would that have progressed in quite the same way? Um, I think so, just because, well, a, a, maybe not the same way, but I think a lot of those, you know, Sherman Antitrust Act was passed before we're even talking about. That was, I believe, 1896. So mm -hmm. there, you know, these things were in the hopper. Um, it wouldn't have been as flourishly prosecuted but i feel like these things were needed to address to ameliorate what was going on in society and and somebody would have taken the political capital of picking up that mantle and making those things happen right. like you said maybe not with as much flair but i i feel like they happen yeah. And then the other thing, you know, that I was thinking about, again, this is Roosevelt's such a personality, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's why it's difficult to, I think, to go down these historical what ifs with him. But, you know, I was just looking, you know, again, again, my notes here, some of the other things, you know, obviously, we talked about the trust busting there, we talked about the foreign policy things. He is very instrumental in <laughs> what goes on in terms of gaining a little place that you can build a canal through called Panama. <laughs> You mean he's personally responsible for the fact that Panama is actually a thing? 
Yeah. 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 You know, and so, you know, would that have eventually, could something like that have happened? Sure. Would it have happened the same way? You know, the answer becomes, I think, probably no. And so there was going to be a canal, you know, at some point across Central America, just because it was a necessary thing that I think was ultimately going to happen. Uh, but, you know, the, we, and we talked about this on a recent episode, the, you know, the French and the French were heavily, were he- and then later the British were heavy players in, in the Suez, mm-hmm. building the Suez Canal. You know, that might have been a French canal <laughs> across the uh uh, across you know somewhere in Central America, it might have been as was discussed, and probably would have faced much more difficulty. It might have crossed Nicaragua instead of Pan- Panama, because that was one of the things that was being thought about. And uh, so you know, again, it's it, there's a lot of speculative what ifs here. We haven't gone deep deep on any of them, but the realization is that you change this major character there in American history, in the case of Roosevelt, in that time frame, and it's tough to speculate, but you know, things would have been different. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to know what, what's pinned, what's pinned. What, what did you pin earlier, Chris, in your brain? Um, the German Philippines, because here's the thing. We, we, we talked a little bit about it, but um, Hey, yeah. Uh, Germany was trying to expand into Asia. They did have some other possessions and as soon as 1914 happened, Japan took all of them. All of them. All of the German bases became Japanese, and that is where World War II, you know, if you look at, like, the German colonies truck, um, the Marianas, Marshalls, a lot of those were bases that the Japanese were able to take over, fortify, and form the perimeter of their empire in World War II that we had to fight. Um, if the Philippines are part of that, here's the interesting thing. Are part of the Japanese empire because they're taken over from the Germans in 1915, basically, as soon as, you know, the war, they can. Um, everything else proceeds as normal. Summer of 1941... Japan decides to move south and take over the other European colonies. The United States is not there. Right. We have no interest in that area. Um, So they go ahead and take over those areas. And as isolationist as the United States was, we, you know, off podcast, I mentioned, we didn't go to war to protect the Netherlands. Why would we go to war to protect the Netherlands East Indies? Right. So I think Japan can open up a lot of those European colonies and the United States isn't in East Asia, isn't involved there. So that's, you know, do we even, at what point do we even get involved? Or is this one of those, um, we still have that undeclared war in the North Atlantic and that's where we start the fighting. Right. Well, or, or, you know, or, or it's only once, you know, Australia and New Zealand, you know, come under threat Mm -hmm. that you know finally there's something that happens there because you know that we've talked about this talk about this on a number of episodes some that you've been on and some that you haven't is you know the amazing thing to me about the start of world war ii obviously there's the impact of uh, the um you know pearl harbor Mm -hmm. (laughs) and what that does uh but as you pointed out in terms of the war in europe while the united states was certainly involved in you know lend lease and you know transporting war material and all the things you know the cash and carry and all the things that go with that uh, there had not been because of the isolationist tendencies uh, United States involvement in Europe. Uh, and it's hard to imagine that would have been any different if Australia and New Zealand were under threat, just if there had not been a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. And then the question is, would the Japanese have felt as compelled to need to do that if they think that, you know, we can consolidate what we need to consolidate and there's no reason to bring, you know, no reason to poke the dragon. Absolutely. Absolutely no reason whatsoever. They can get everything they need in their backyard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it, it's interesting, you know, to, to think through just again, you know, now I'm really thinking it through, cause we, you know, one of the things we talked about off podcast is, okay, how do we even flip this outcome here? Because it was a pretty decisive U.S. win. Well, you know, there's the element of fighting the battle smarter, Mm-hmm. and bringing short batteries into play but you know <laughs> literally a couple of shots from some onshore you know some onshore guns 
Ripple's a good way across history here. Yeah, by the way, other thing you just pointed out, we, we're we not even at Pearl Harbor. We don't perhaps, even have Hawaii. Perhaps not, perhaps not if there's not the formal annexation of Hawaii. You're right. Right. <laughs> Um, in fact, one of the things I was reading as I was preparing, you know, the whole thing of there was concern in the West Coast of the United States as the war was breaking out about, you know, we're sort of, you know, what if Spain attacks us, you know, from mm-hmm. from the Pacific? There, there were, you know, there it wasn't a large U.S. fleet. So the this taking place, you know, again, as I mentioned, almost in some ways, Manila Bay feels like a, a reversed, oh, that was after the declaration of hostilities. Things were already rolling in such a way that, you know, I don't think Roosevelt would have given an order to attack before things were formally declared. But boy, we sure were rolling as if things were going to be declared. And of course, the truth of the Pearl Harbor situation was if uh, things had arrived properly, it would have been a sneak attack. But right after the declaration of war had been delivered kind of thing. Right. In, in the real timeline, I mean, you know, there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a clerical error there that sort of sort of plays into that. The other two things that jumped out at me are that are small, but they're important. Uh, little stuff, animals in the shape of bears that people would have uh, may not be called teddy bears. That's true. And there's uh, faces on a mountain in South Dakota. Mm-hmm. One of them is Mr. Roosevelt's face. Mm-hmm. To go along with uh, what Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln. So I'm going to put you on the spot here, Chris. Uh, in fact, in a lot of places, uh, I play a game with friends where we talk about the, re- you know, name for it's, it's, it's a Mount Rushmore of something. So the Mount Rushmore sure. of, you know, American quarterbacks or the Mount Rushmore of, you know, soccer players or whatever it is. Well, because of the actual, you know, four images there on Mount Rushmore. So no TR. Who's the fourth Mount Rushmore candidate? Um, Roosevelt. Franklin. <laughs> yes. I, I, I was saying this, right? Like, in one episode, I had him killed off. In another, I had him resign in disgrace. Like, I really don't have anything against Teddy Roosevelt. I do really love FDR. FDR is my favorite of the Roosevelt presidents, I guess. You know, but, but, like, yeah, Roosevelt, FDR. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, so it happens later or, you know, who knows, uh, you know, Borglum, who's the the architect of that, may have been may have been scouring through nineteenth century. You know, I don't know, maybe an Andrew Jackson. Or, you know, you have to have somebody else. You know, assuming that it happens when it does in the in the early twentieth century, he may have been he may have been scouring back for some other uh, you know connection there. So again, that's that's the other ripple effect here. No teddy bears and potential potentially a different Mount Rushmore. So uh, um, last thing. Dewey's Chewies. One of the promotional things that came out after Manila Bay, you mentioned George Dewey was the commander. Um, somebody, and I don't know who, decided to come out with Dewey's Chewies, which was a brand of chewing gum. In you know, I don't know whether it was actually endorsed by the Admiral, but it was taking advantage of that. So yeah, that changes the history of American chewing gum. Oh, wow. So... Uh... <laughs> We haven't talked about a title for the episode, Chris, yeah. but I just think you titled the episode "No Dewey's Chewies." Quite possibly, uh, I'm, and and we haven't even gotten to what McCarthyism did to Big Red. <laughs> well, actually, th- this came up in a conversation or something I saw this past week. It was a game show, actually, this past mm-hmm. week. Uh, the rec- you know, I'm a big baseball fan, and recognizing that there was the period of time when the Cincinnati Reds, popular American baseball team abandoned that name uh during the 50s because the you know they didn't want to be the reds but yeah. uh yeah so yeah but no no dewey's chewies i think that's <laughs> if it doesn't end up being the title uh, for those of you that stuck around to the end of the episode knowing that could have been the title even if we call it something else no dewey's chewies that uh that jumps out at me any big things there's lots of big things we could have gone down here this could have been a 14 hour episode but any big things you think we missed chris not really no i'm you know I, I again, we've destroyed a political legend. We've, you know, stopped. I, I think this might have been the first time we stopped World War II, at least American involvement in it. Every, wow. you know, we've done multiple different times, and every single time I keep no, 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 still what? Yeah, we might have done every it. time we think we're out, they keep pulling us back in. Maybe and this we is might the have done it. so. Again, if you uh, if you want to take the science fiction angle on this, and you've got your time machine, and you're trying to figure out how to how to make change that, apparently you need to go to uh, you need to go to the Philippines in late April. 
1898. Well, That's where you need to target your traveler to. Stay tuned for future episodes because I think we can come up with some other ones. Maybe yeah. you don't like the heat. You know, the humidity. It might. <laughs> yeah. We'll work on that. Yeah. Well, Chris, as always, enjoy having you. And uh, we were talking off podcast just to tease our listeners a little bit. Uh, Chris is going to be producing some of his own episodes and bringing some other folks in as well. So I'm excited about what we're doing there. I do want to encourage folks. Uh, this again came as a listener suggestion. And so remind you, we look for that. So go to www.aforkintimepodcast.com and uh, you can put in your suggestions there. And I got to be honest with you, Chris, when I first saw this topic, it's like, yeah, that's interesting. And it gets us into a different time frame in a different part of the world. But my first thought when I saw the topic suggestion was not that we would spend most of the episode and our listener may be upset that we spent a whole lot more time talking about Teddy Roosevelt than mm -hmm. maybe other things as well. I don't know. Hopefully we'll get feedback on that. But my first blush thought was not, oh, well, obviously, that changes the U.S. involvement in World War II and does something to Teddy Roosevelt. That was not my first thought when yeah. I saw the topic. And that's what I love about what we do here in the sense of once you start you know, tracing things out and thinking it through, you suddenly realize, oh, that's bigger than I thought it was. Oh, yeah. And, and a big part of that. All right. Chris, if you don't have anything, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close this out here and thank you again and thank our listeners again. I do remind you to visit the podcast, uh, visit the website for the podcast. Uh, a lot of stuff going on there, including the entire back catalog, links to uh, ways that you can support and, and, and publicize the show, all the good stuff that's there. Won't go into a lot of detail because if you go there, you'll find it www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Uh, as we as we appreciate, as always, more than anything else, though, our listeners and their their willingness to give us some of their time and their attention, and we value that. And as we head on here through 2021, as we're now launched pretty good ways through the first part of January there, very hopeful that we continue to see vaccines rolling out and pandemics uh, coming to an end so that by the time we get to the end of 2021, we'll have a lot to uh, smile about and be happy about. So on behalf of Chris, Alexis, who's not even here, but obviously a big part of the podcast, we want to thank you for listening and hope that you join us next time. Thanks. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more about the podcast at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Join us next time.